Five. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, good, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you are, I don't know. Um, welcome to the special edition of our um, favorite seminar. So it's our pleasure to welcome um, Stephen Wolfram today, who will be familiar to many of us, I mean, going back a long way from his work on cellular automata, which, as I said in the announcement earlier, was somewhat of an entry drug to, to, to some of us anyway, to computational modeling. Um, and we probably heard of Mathematica in the meantime, and uh, we may come to that in the discussion, but there was even some work on using Mathematica to implement graph rewriting in the, in the 90s. Um, but now uh, the reason why he's here is that this pro project he's just shown here on the web page, the Wolfram Physics Project, is developing some of those ideas on computational modeling into a new foundation for science and, and, and maybe physics in particular. So, so if you feel like we are going round in circles and sort of coming full circles back to where we started from, maybe that's that's deliberate. But let's let us hear from 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 Wolfram um, himself. Great. Thank you very much. Well, pleased to be here. I think I gave a very ambitious title about graph rewriting for science technology in the universe. Um, let me see if I can live up to that. I think uh, you've heard recently from Jonathan Gorard, and um, I will perhaps give both the back some backstory and some forward story uh, from what Jonathan has uh, has probably told you about. Um, I'll probably be a, a less technical than Jonathan and um, uh, cover, well, all kinds of strange things. But um, I suppose the bottom line is, uh, Graph rewriting is turning out to be much more important than I ever imagined, maybe even than you guys thought, because it seems like our whole universe is based on graph rewriting. And, you know, in a sense, it's graph rewriting all the way down. It's a very big graph, perhaps 10 to the 400 nodes right now um, that uh, make up our universe. And uh, I'll try and tell you a little bit about the models that get us to that point. And uh, maybe what I'll do is uh, talk about sort of the backstory of how I got involved with graph rewriting, some of the intuition that's led to the things that we're now thinking about with our physics project. Then I'll talk about kind of the structure of the physics project. Then I'll talk about kind of how the ideas and the formalism for the physics project, very much grounded in graph rewriting, uh, seem to be applicable to an awful lot of other fields. And the thing that has me most excited right now is not only do we seem to be cracking physics, but we seem to have a lot to be able to say about lots of other fields. And so uh, uh, I, I want to talk about some of those things. Um, I've been sort of interested in graph rewriting for a long time. I wish you guys had been around like 40 years ago when I was first starting to, to study these kinds of things. And um, I wish uh, some of the literature that now existed, which I don't understand that well, um, had existed at that time. But uh, anyway, so let's see. Well, my 40 year graph rewriting journey. Well, let me, let me tell you how this started and um, uh, uh, sort of a little bit of the, the, the track that it's gone on. So long, long ago, when I was quite young, I used to do uh, particle physics and uh, particle physics involves doing all sorts of complicated mathematical calculations and so on. I didn't like doing those by hand. I, I started using computers and trying to invent computer systems to do that. And back in 1979, I decided it's time to sort of create a general kind of computer system for doing symbolic computation. And so I was interested in what would be the right foundation for such a system. It was a system called SMP that I, I built at that time. And so the foundation that I kind of, I sort of went back to the, the, uh, the literature of mathematical logic and things like that. And the foundation that I ended up uh, using was the idea of uh, rewriting rules for symbolic expressions that basically everything about the system was transformations on symbolic expressions. Turns out that was a pretty good idea. And 40 something years later, that's the core idea of Wolfram Language and Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha and all the things that are, that are based on this. But, um, uh, and that, that so the, the kind of, that's a notion not yet of graph rewriting, that's a notion of expression rewriting. And uh, just to give some sense of, of what um, uh, in, in kind of the, what, what do we mean? What kind of expressions are we talking about when we deal with expression rewriting? And this will sort of come back later uh, when we talk about um, other things here. Let me see. Um, 
Okay, so let's just say I, you know, I type something in here. This is just an expression that um, I don't know some random thing here that might be a piece of math. Um, and uh, you know, in the end, this is just a tree. Uh, there it is. You can think of that as a as a graph that's being rewritten. Everything you do, if you say you know f of x blank y blank, um, uh, you know colon equals I don't know x plus y or something. That's the analog of defining a function. But it's a transformation rule for a symbolic expression where these blank things are pattern variables. And so it turns out this, this whole structure is, is more general than I had ever imagined in the sense that, that it's been, um, uh, you know, if I just type something like this in, I can say, I don't know, make a table of f of uh, ij or something. Um, I don't know, i from i up to four, j up to four or something, not very exciting, but but you get the sense of what's what's happening here. It's just it's just applying these um, uh, rewrite rules for symbolic expressions. And um, this this turns out to be a vastly more general idea and a and a very terrific idea as sort of a foundation for computation that we humans understand. We'll talk more about that later. But um, you know, you can you can anything can be thought of as a symbolic expression. You know, you just have X, okay, it's just X. We could say make a, a random graph with you know 100 nodes, 300 edges or something. Okay, there's our graph. It too is just a symbolic expression. I could I could write it out as a as show its tree, but I could I could then just do, I don't know, I could say uh, you know, treat it as a graph. There it is in 3D or something. I mean, I could make a um uh, some kind of community graph plot of this thing. Um, so if that works, does that work in 3D? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, so, you know, all, all these things are just symbolic expressions and what's happening inside is just a giant rewriting engine for, uh, for symbolic expressions. And, you know, symbolic expressions can be used to represent all kinds of things. You know, I could say, well, here I'm using um, uh, some natural language uh, to, um, to enter my, my thing, which will be turned into a symbolic expression. Um, so that's asking for capital cities in Europe, and I'll get some list of them, and I could say, you know, and again, each one of these things is just a piece of symbolic expression. We can we can look, if we want to know what that symbolic expression is, we could go look at it. Um, uh, there it is. Um, but uh, we could just say, you know, take those symbolic expressions, which in this particular case happen to represent a bunch of cities, and, you know, make a, a plot of where those cities are or some such other thing. Um, so, you know, everything, I don't know, we can, there's, there's just a whole range of different kinds of things which are represented as symbolic expressions. So symbolic expressions turn out to be this extremely general way to represent everything, um, whether it's, uh, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's pick something else just for fun, just to give some sense of what kinds of things, I don't know. Uh, let's say we have a bio sequence, maybe we could say, make me a molecule out of that bio sequence. I don't know whether this will make a sensible molecule, but let's say, let's just say, uh, and here, this thing will now be a graph and we can go and, uh, uh, and take all these. The, the thing that's wonderful about representing everything as a symbolic expression is that the operations that you can do, you can define very general operations um, that work across all these different kinds of things. Okay, so that's, that was, uh, that's kind of, um, uh, a little bit of, of transformation rules on symbolic expressions. So the first place I really got interested in graph rewriting was actually in the, um, uh, around the mid 1980s, I was involved in trying to make a programming language for a massively parallel computer called the connection machine. And I was convinced that the way to think about parallel programming was something to do with graph rewriting. And I spent a bunch of time thinking about this and I never really figured out how to do it at the time. Um, so that was kind of my first introduction to, to graph rewriting. But then I uh, got, um, actually already around that time, had um, uh, got involved with um, a different question, which was a sort of foundational question in natural science, which is how should one best make models of things? You know, I had been used to doing all kinds of fancy mathematical physics, and but I was interested in sort of a bunch of questions about kind of how the natural world comes to be the way it is, 
And the methods that I knew from mathematical physics were not as helpful as I'd hoped there. You know, you want to know the shape of a snowflake. It's not particularly helpful to try and solve the BDEs. You want to know sort of why fundamentally turbulence arises in fluids. It's not particularly helpful to look at the BDEs. So I got interested in, in what were sort of alternatives as ways to make foundational models of things. And obviously there was a 300 year history of if you want to make a serious model of a natural system, use mathematical equations. But I got interested, this is in the early 1980s, I got interested in sort of how would you generalize that approach? What could you do that was sort of uh, more general than just using mathematical equations? And kind of the, um, uh, the thing that I realized is, of course, in those times one has programs and programs can sort of represent more arbitrary kinds of rules than one thinks are encoded in mathematical equations. So I got interested in kind of what, how could you, could you make models of the world using programs rather than equations, using programs that represent simple rules. And so then the question that, that came up was, okay, so we're imagining sort of modeling the world with programs. Uh, how, what, what do even simple programs typically do? And so that got me into the question of sort of exploring the computational universe of possible simple programs. And my favorite uh, type to study are uh, these things called cellular automata. And just to show you the, the, um, the basic idea, uh, probably by now everybody knows about these, but um, who knows? Um, so this is a typical one-dimensional cellular automaton. It's just a line of cells, each one either black or white. And uh, the thing evolves in a, in a sequence of time steps. At each step, the color of each cell is determined just by the, the color of the cell above it and the ones to its left and right. So, okay, so what does this thing actually do? So if we take um, this particular rule and we say, just evolve it from um, uh, um, a uh, simple initial condition, just one cell or something, let's um, do this. Uh, something like this. Okay, so that, that's um, what this rule leads to. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of more or less what you would expect, very simple rule, very simple behavior. Let's change the rule a little bit. Let's say we use rule 90 instead. That's just the, the numbers are just the binary decomposition of the, the binary decomposition is just that series of bits there. So rule 90 will get a slightly more complicated pattern. We continue it a while. It'll be a kind of elaborate nested, oops, let's get rid of the mesh. Um, It'll be an elaborate nested pattern, but still we might say, okay, it's what we expect. Uh, maybe a very intricate pattern, but it's a very simple rule and it's sort of inevitable that we'll get some kind of very, very organized, um, very predictable structure out from such a simple rule. Okay, well, that was what I thought back in early beginning of the 1980s. And then uh, I ended up wondering, is that really true? And um, so I decided to do a little experiment. And uh, it's a bit easier to do now than it was then, but um, we can just say, let's look at all possible rules. Let's say the first, um, uh, let's just say the first, uh, um, first 64 rules of this type, and let's just see what they all do. Okay, so this is, this is now sort of doing a, an experiment in the computational universe, just see what these things do. What's the natural history of, of these kinds of very simple programs? So you see many of them, simple programs, simple behavior. Sometimes we get these nested patterns and so on. Okay, here is my all-time favorite science discovery. This is rule 30 um, in, the, uh, in the enumeration of these rules. We can go back here and say, what is the actual underlying rule for rule 30? There it is. Uh, what does rule 30 actually do? Here's what it does. So to me, this is extremely surprising, kind of an intuition breaking uh, object because very simple rule, very simple initial condition, yet the behavior you get is very complicated. There are some obvious regularities in it, but if you look, for example, at the center column of cells here, for all practical purposes, it seems completely random. We used it for many years as a pseudorandom generator and it did very well. So this is kind of a weird phenomenon that uh, even though there's a very simple rule, the behavior produced by just running that rule is very complicated. And this got me excited about whether this was sort of the mechanism that nature uses to make lots of complicated things that, that it makes. And uh, I spent many years exploring that question and finding out that just an awful lot of different kinds of systems in nature seem to work in this kind of way, that they have simple rules, 
But those rules, see, when, when we make up rules to do engineering and so on, we have a tremendous habit of, of just using rules where we can foresee what consequences they're going to have. But, and so we avoid rules like this where we can't readily foresee the consequences, but nature doesn't do that. And so nature, in a sense, much more effortlessly makes all this very complicated stuff. So, okay. So the thing, the, the um, uh, first observation, and we're going to, this is going to connect very strongly with graphs in a little while. Um, the, uh, the first sort of big observation is sort of in the computational universe of possible simple programs, it's actually very common to see simple programs produce very complicated behavior. So uh, one of the things that, um, uh, well, let's see. So, so we can ask sort of what are some consequences of that uh, realization? So one of the biggest ones is a thing that I call the principle of computational equivalence, which is something that I think is sort of a general principle that lets one understand a lot of kinds of things. And what does that principle say? Well, one thing one can do is ask, how should one think about what's happening in rule 30? And one way to think about it is sort of everything that's going on as a computation. So what's happening is we're starting from some initial data here. This is the rule for our computation. We're doing chug, chug, chug with that, with that rule and generating some output from the computation. And the question then is sort of how sophisticated is this computation? Is this computation somehow trivial or is it somehow, uh, somehow sophisticated? So this principle of computational equivalence, it's sort of, it's sort of an intuitive statement is if the behavior is not obviously simple, it will be computationally as sophisticated as anything can be. So that's a that's at first an intuitive and sort of qualitative statement, but it has all kinds of specific implications. So an example of an implication is it suggests that a bunch of these systems should be computation universal, that whenever you see something that isn't sort of obviously simple in its behavior, it should actually be computation universal. So we don't know that. Uh, it's, it's hard to get good evidence about this. We do know, here's, a, here's an example where we do know that. This is the rule 110 cellular automaton. It happens to only grow on one side here. Um, and you see it, it's making these kind of weird structures. Maybe I'll run it for 2000 steps instead. And you can perhaps see the, the little structures that it's making. And the thing you might be able to imagine is maybe we could take those structures and make them sort of interact like logic gates and, or something and, uh, and actually encode computations that we can understand. And indeed with great effort, one can do that. So this principle of computational equivalence kind of uh, has this, this sort of suggestion that um, has this implication that even these very simple systems will tend to be computation universal. And uh, that's something where we're progressively getting more evidence for that. Uh, let me show you another piece of evidence that we got a number of years ago, and actually there's more coming now, but um, uh, this is, uh, uh, I looked at a bunch of Turing machines, and this is the very simplest Turing machine, which doesn't have obviously simple behavior. And it turns out that yes, the young, chap um, called Alex Smith proved that in fact this, this Turing machine is indeed universal. So that's sort of another piece of evidence for this principle of computational equivalence. If it doesn't look trivial, it will turn out among other things to be universal. So, and, and this, is the, this is the simplest uh, possible uh, universal Turing machine. The, um, so another implication that's going to be important for some of the things we talk about um, about principle of computational equivalences and implies this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility. So sort of one of the, the big successes of, of standard sort of mathematical science has been you write down a model for something and then that immediately lets you figure out sort of everything about what that thing is going to do. So, you know, you have a model for an idealized two body system. You can figure out, you know, where will the earth be a million years from now in that idealized model. You don't have to follow a million orbits. You just plug a number into a formula and work out the answer. That's sort of the story of computational reusability. We've been able by being clever about our modeling, we've been able to get answers with much less computational effort than nature itself uses in some sense. So one of the implications of this principle of computational equivalence is that that shouldn't always be true, that there should be systems where they are computationally irreducible in the sense that to work out the outcome of what happens in them will take essentially as much computational effort as just running the system itself. And, and again, it's perhaps intuitively useful to understand why a, a result like that would come out. Basically, the point is, if you believe that there's this sort of uh, level of computational sophistication that's achieved by this whole range of systems, it's going to be achieved 
not only by things like rule 30, but also by things like our brains and the mathematics that we use and so on. And so essentially what the principle of computational equivalence is saying is you might think you're gonna be a lot smarter than this really simple uh, program here, but you're not. You're just going to be equivalent in your computational sophistication to what's happening in this simple program. And that's why there's this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. That's why you can't expect to kind of jump ahead and figure out what this program is going to do much more efficiently than it itself does it. Now you can try and you can start sort of tightening up this idea of computational irreducibility, sort of the infinite time version of it has to do with undecidability. There are sort of computational complexity versions of finite time versions of it. Um, but for me, the most important thing is sort of the intuitive basis of thinking about uh, what's happening in, in a system with, a simple, with simple rules and this kind of phenomenon. What we'll see in the physics project is that it's very important that that one gets a certain degree of unpredictability. One gets a certain amount of randomness generated. In a sense, that's a phenomenon that one has seen in a zillion other systems. Like, you know, the digits of pi have a simple program, yet once generated, they seem for practical purposes random. The point of, in a sense, of, of this whole sort of science that I've tried to build around studying the computational universe is it gives one a framework for thinking about phenomena like that kind of uh, occurrence of randomness in, in something from simple rules. Okay. Well, so uh, that's so one of the things that I, so having sort of discovered some of these phenomena in cellular automata, I then spent uh, a bunch of years exploring sort of how general are these phenomena. And so I ended up writing this big book called New Kind of Science, which came out in, in 2002. Um, but the thing I wanted to, to show here is um, uh, kind of the, the main exploration of that book sort of the core of it had to do with exploring the computational universe and finding that the phenomena that I had first seen in cellular automata was not specific to cellular automata. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that there's a, a bunch of cells that are updating in parallel or any of those kinds of things. Here it is for a Turing machine. That's the behavior of a simple Turing machine. Um, uh, here it is for a, a substitution system, uh, just a, 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 a string rewrite system. Um, here it is for, uh, oh, this is a tag system, another uh, kind of simple rewrite type system. Um, here it is for a register machine, um, something sort of more mathematical in structure, uh, it's its program. And that's uh, eventually when you, when you look in, in enough detail at what it does, that's what this one ends up doing. Uh, so again, simple program, complicated behavior. And this is what I sort of saw all over the computational universe. And then I wanted uh, started looking, well, you can look at systems even based on numbers. You can even look at systems that come from things like arithmetic. Um, you can look at, uh, here's one that's kind of interesting, recursive functions. These are sort of doubly nested recursive functions. Same phenomenon, simple rule, complicated behavior. If you just sort of just start looking kind of out in the, in the universe of possible, in the sort of computational universe of possible programs, you find this all over the place. Here it is even in partial differential equations. These are nonlinear wave equations that uh, uh, have been very challenging to study from any mathematical point of view. But if you just sort of explore the universe of possible equations, you very quickly run into this kind of behavior. Okay, so another piece of my effort here had to do with looking at, did it matter that the cellular automata I was studying were one dimensional? Did it matter that, um, uh, that the cells were just arranged in a line? Well, the answer is no for cellular automata. There's a, a weird thing grown by a two-dimensional cellular automaton, uh, weird two-dimensional Turing machines and so on. Um, then I started looking at systems that were based not on definite uh, arrangements of, for example, cells in space, but were, for example, uh, network-based systems. And um, here, um, here was a first example of a system based on a kind of network rewriting rule. These are not, I, I would say, these are not my favorite systems. Um, these are, uh, in a sense, very emaciated graph rewriting systems. Um, but like so many of these systems, um, they end up, uh, even for other simple rules, they end up producing very complicated behavior. And here, the way these work, um, well, the, the, basically the point is that the structure, the connectivity is variable here. There's not a fixed, a, a fixed arrangement of, of, of values like there is in a cellular automaton, for example. 
Okay, then another thing I looked at are things I call multi-way systems, which will feature prominently in, uh, in the physics project. Um, uh, and a multi-way system, the idea these have gone by many names, they've been reinvented, I think at least a dozen times in the last century or so, because um, they're kind of an obvious idea. Um, I think some of their names are, are vastly obscure. I've, I, um, multi-way system seems to be a, a name that people understand. But the idea here is we've just got a, a string rewrite here, and we're saying these are the possible rewritings that we might make. And this traces out sort of all the possible strings that can be gotten from those rewritings. Okay, so once again, even though in this case, in some sense, we don't, we're not dealing with a single thread of time or anything here, um, in some sense, uh, 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 even in these systems, I quickly found, yes, indeed, um, once again, even with simple rules, the behavior can be very complicated. So, and just to fill in one more thing, because it perhaps is of some interest, um, even when there's no notion of time at all, in a multi-way system, there's kind of a, a multi-dimensional notion of time or a, a notion of time that goes in many branches. Um, even if your system is just done based on constraints, there's no notion of time. It's just like a, a, a you know, an elliptic equation or something where it's just like, uh, here's the constraint, go satisfy it. So this is saying we have a tiling and here are a set of constraints, now go satisfy those constraints. Even in that case, well, I, I never found in the wild, this is the most complicated thing I found in the wild. This is the first tiling that forces non-periodicity. This is the first set of tiling constraints that force non-periodicity. Um, but I know that one can get tiling constraints, again, that force things like rule 30. These are sort of uh, random crystals in some sense. Okay, so main takeaway from this is uh, even though simple rules of almost any kind um, uh, can generate complicated behavior. Well, uh, I've just mentioned for multi-way systems, one place that I made a lot of use of those is in studying kind of the foundations of mathematics. I kind of thought of the application of um, uh, axiom systems as being like that. That's a particular proof made by applying these particular axioms. It's a rewrite system, as you all know. And um, uh, this is sort of a, the multi-way version of that. And I was kind of thinking a bunch about kind of the foundations of mathematics and metamathematics in terms of these, these multi-way systems. Okay, so that was kind of how things were. And well, the, the, as, as, so I had sort of studied this computational universe, um, these properties of the computational universe is mostly in the 1990s. And uh, I was steadily studying the applications of this for different kinds of things, like you know, you can uh, study mollusk pigmentation patterns and find out that you have kind of cellular automaton-like patterns and so on. But also, the thing that I was interested in was, okay, what about fundamental physics? Um, can I, uh, you know, yes, I can study growth of plants and animals and things, but what about um, uh, uh, what about fundamental physics? Is there a chance that this phenomena that I found in the computational universe are also relevant to our particular physical universe? So I got then to thinking about, okay, um, how, uh, how might physics work? And the thing that I realized quickly is cellular automata are absolutely not gonna cut it. Space and time, we already know from the work that's happened in general relativity and other kinds of things, space and time are too fungible for a cellular automaton that has this very fixed notion of space and time to be the right kind of underlying model. So I kind of realized one has to go sort of underneath space and time and, and look at things that are sort of lower level than that. And so that got me into looking at, uh, at networks and thinking about, and I'll talk much more about this, but thinking about space as a network and realizing that yes, you know, you can have networks that have effectively on their large scale limits, any number of dimensions, uh, realized that, um, you know, you can represent sort of the curvature of these limiting structures and so on. And then realized that, uh, um, I started thinking about, well, okay, if you have these networks, how might they evolve? And realized, well, it can work just essentially like cellular automata or like any kind of rewrite system where you have just something that says, when you have a piece of network that looks like this, rewrite it to be like that. 
So I looked at all kinds of things. I, I wondered maybe there was a, a way of thinking about networks for the universe and sort of the way that one was thinking about tilings, you know, laying down the whole space-time structure of the universe. So this is an example, uh, which probably has been studied in some other way, and I'd be interested to know about it, um, of kind of the, the analog of tilings for networks, where you say, I insist that every part is a vertex transitive object, and I insist that every part of it have this kind of um, thing at, at each, at each uh, point. What, what structure can you make? But instead, I thought more seriously about time and about the, um, uh, and this is, and, and what I realized is that, uh, and we'll talk about more about this, but, but um, a, a sort of important realization is if you're actually trying to make a model of the whole universe, one thing that you have to make a model of is the observer of the universe. And the observer of the universe is made of the same stuff as the universe. So you have to put the observer inside the system, and that puts all kinds of constraints on how you, what kind of information you can get out of the system. And so the main thing I realized is that that uh, the main kind of um, thing you can detect if you are embedded within the system is essentially the causal graph of the causal relationships between events, between updating events that are happening in the system. So in a sense, what comes out, uh, whatever actually happens, all that you as an observer of the system are sensitive to is the kind of causal graph that represents the causal relationships between updating events. And so then the big thing that I was really excited about is that turned out to imply um, in these models, the validity of special relativity. Um, and uh, I studied a bunch at this time, the evolution of networks. There's a very trivial piece of network evolution. Um, I was uh, really trying to explore, these are some kind of lousy visualizations of, um, uh, of network rewriting, uh, successive uh, updates being made to networks sort of over the course of time. And um, uh, so I got interested in, in uh, the, what one of the key ideas here was the idea of causal invariance that I'll talk about some more later, um, that has to do with uh, under what circumstances are the rewrite rules for these systems such that Independent of the specific rewriting order, the causal graph of relationship of causal relationships is always the same. And so, what I found is that yes, there are certain. Where do I have these? There are certain rewrite rules um, that have the right non-overlap properties for graphs, so that you get this causal invariance property. Well, okay, so I was um, uh, so I kind of had gotten to the starting gate in terms of thinking about graphs as an underlying structure for physics. And I kind of realized that in the large scale limit, one could derive at least the vacuum Einstein equations um, as sort of the, the large scale behavior of these, of these, um, of these graphs in, in space time. Um, so that was kind of how far I had got when I published this big book, New Kind of Science. The, it was a little disappointing because basically lots of areas of, of science people found the kind of models that I constructed from the kind of computational universe uh, very useful and very interesting. Um, the one kind of major counterexample was fundamental physics, where people were like, we're really happy with string theory. It's all good. We're going to figure everything out. We don't need any new ideas, uh, which was kind of, kind of a, a, a funny thing. And, you know, in a sense, what happened in other areas of science is something that uh, has been a really interesting trend. I mean, for you know, for about 300 years, it was kind of mathematical equations, they're the way to model things. And then in a period of just a couple of decades or so, and you know, I, my efforts were perhaps one contribution to this, probably not the only one, um, there's been this sort of progressive realization that no, actually programs are a better way if you're making models of lots of kinds of things, they're better raw material for making models of things. And so there's been this kind of uh, silent, complete revolution, I think, in the way that modeling is done from something based on mathematical equations to something done uh, based on programs. But the one area this did not affect was fundamental physics. And so after, um, uh, so so I, I was sort of interested, okay, um, uh, let's see, where am I going here? Um, what, um, uh, sorry, let me just um, pull up something relevant here. Um, uh, what could be done with, um, uh, you know, what, what could be done with these kinds of ideas about the computational universe um, 
uh, about fundamental physics. And so I, I worked on this a bit. Let's see if I can find, uh, sorry, I, uh, where is it? Um, here we go. Um, so in the, in the early 2000s, um, I uh, decided to work on this a bit more and uh, looked a bunch at network substitution systems, AKA graph rewriting systems, and um, you can find all these things as I'm on, on the web. But, but um, so I, I was looking at all these different kinds of, um, uh, kinds of graph rewriting things and trying to understand, trying to catalog what happened, sort of looking at the natural history of graph rewriting. And, and I found uh, some things I found quite frustrating. Um, I, I know that you guys have formalisms now to, to figure these kinds of things out. But for example, one of the things that I found frustrating was that not every graph rewriting that I could write down was a sensible to me graph rewriting. For example, if the you know symmetry of the left hand side was greater than the symmetry of the right hand side, it was like, well, which of those outcomes should I actually generate? Now I've realized subsequently that I was being kind of stupid about that, and that that's really a big sign you should be using a multi-way system. But that wasn't something I realized at the time, and for me that was like I can only pick great graph rewritings that don't have this property, for example, of having lower symmetry on the left than on the right. And I also found that this property of causal invariance that I thought was important for physics was comparatively rare among these graph rewritings that I looked at. Now, you know, I, I so, you know, lots of stuff about, about graph rewriting and lots of kind of natural history and, and lots of kinds of nice limiting structures from graph rewriting, but uh, I wasn't very satisfied with, with what was going on. It, it felt like I was, uh, and I was using here always trivalent graphs. That was kind of the minimal uh, graph structure that I was looking at. And I, and I had various graphs. These are, um, I particularly looked at graphs that had um, kind of uh, uh, ordering of the elements at every node, uh, as, as well as I had looked at ones without that, but then I looked at ones with that um, and uh, found all sorts of interesting kind of natural history of these things. But I, I was still not very satisfied with the model because I'd always felt a little bit arbitrary that, you know, why is one using trivalent graphs? Why is one having to pick only these particular rules that um, aren't, um, uh, um, aren't um, uh, th that uh, have these sort of properties that are good for the structure of the rule, but don't seem to have much sort of abstractly important about them. So this, this project kind of languished for a long time. And during that time, kind of the whole Wolfram language and so on, and, and all of the, you know, everything you can do with symbolic tra transformation rules on symbolic expressions, uh, I spent decades uh, sort of doing everything one can do with that um, and uh, uh, building a, a, a sort of a giant stack of tools related to the, those kinds of things that have been useful, I, I think, to lots of people in lots of places for lots of kinds of things. But, but gradually, as I sort of understood more about what one could do with these kind of this sort of foundational idea of transformation rules on symbolic expressions, it kind of got me even more sort of, well, we should really figure out something about physics. But, well, this takes us to about two years ago. And uh, two years ago, well, uh, the history is a little bit more complicated, but, but, um, but basically I was thinking about this stuff and, um, uh, ended up realizing that there was actually a more obvious, more straightforward way to think about what I had been thinking about graph rewriting, uh, which was something that was just a pure, you've got uh, um, a, a, a big, you know, you've got collections of relations between elements. And the only thing you're doing is rewrite rules that apply to these ordered relations that, that take uh, let's say a couple of ordered relations and combine them to get other ordered relations. And you can think about that in, in terms of a hypergraph, um, but you can think about that just sort of algebraically if you want to, in terms of just these collections of relations and rewriting of collections of relations. Okay, so conveniently at that time, uh, Jonathan Gorard was, was involved with our summer school and there was also a person called Max Piskanoff. And um, this was uh, now in the in the summer of 2019. I was like talking about uh, well, there's this possible way to um, uh, generalize what I've tried to do with fundamental physics using this what amounts to hypergraph rewriting, and um, 
uh, the the basic sentiment was, and I was like, I don't know whether I really want to do this. It's it's all rather difficult. I'm not sure we're going to actually be able to get past the first 10 to the minus 1,000 seconds in the evolution of the universe, and it's going to be hard to tell what's going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, the younger generation was more enthusiastic and were like, you've just got to do this. Um, and so in uh, the fall of 2019, we started really investigating um, what uh, what could be done with hypergraph rewriting systems. And the results were rather spectacular. Um, and uh, I would say that the, um, the thing, the, the sort of biggest meta surprise was that it just seems like physics is a lot easier than we had expected. Um, so, it, uh, so let, let, me, let me now sort of paint the picture of what, um, uh, what we figured out about kind of the, the structure of, of, of physics. And let me, let me give you kind of first kind of a, an overall visual summary of what's going to happen here. Um, and maybe I, I, Jonathan has probably gone over this in, in much more precise mathematical detail, but let me try and give sort of a, a, a sketch of what's going on. So the first thing about these models is that they turn back a whole bunch of history in physics. And because basically for a really long time, people have thought space is just a thing that's there and you put things in it and you define positions in space and you don't really have to talk about what space is in, in any sense. You don't have to talk about what space is made of. Space is just a background that things in physics exist in. So one of the key ideas here is to think that space is made of stuff. And in a sense, this isn't terribly surprising. I mean, we've, we've, uh, you know, people might have wondered what is water made of. Well, it's just, you know, it's just a fluid. It just flows. It's continuous and so on. But actually, we know, well, no, really, it's made of discrete molecules bouncing around. So the the first contention is space is the same kind of way. Space is made of discrete kinds of things. One can talk about them as atoms of space. So what are the characteristics of these atoms of space? Nothing. They're just objects, elements that have an identity, and you know when two elements are the same, and that's it. Okay, what, what are the relationships between these elements? Well, there are these relations between elements that you can represent as hyperedges in a hypergraph. They're just some uh, ordered collection, ordered relation between these elements. That's what things are made of. So, so then the idea is the whole universe is just made of space. It's made of these, this collection of elements, these collection of atoms of space, all related by these connections. And that's it. There's nothing else. So you say, well, well, how come, uh, you know, what, what's all the stuff that we see, electrons and quarks and all that kind of thing? Well, all of those things have to emerge as features of this underlying sort of structure of space. And we already know from like cellular automata, we've seen like things like rule 110 that had all those little particle structures running around. We already know that it's possible to have kind of localized structures emerge from systems that have local rules and so on. And so the, uh, the when we think about something like a particle, and this is kind of the, the giant homework exercise, one of the many giant homework exercises for graph rewriting from all of this is to understand the topological obstructions that exist in graph rewriting, to understand what kind of a thing might a somewhat stable localized structure in graph rewriting be, because that kind of thing is what seems to be what what uh, well we what we think is sort of at the core of things like particles, like electrons, and things like that. But in any case, the sort of the idea is: what is the universe made of? It's all made of space. There are features of space that are like these topological obstructions that represent things like particles. Um, but on a large scale, the the, uh, the the and the structure of the universe is just like space. It's just it's just made of space. And what's happening is that there are uh, dynamics to that in the same kind of way that um, uh, you can derive fluid mechanics from underlying molecular dynamics. So similarly here, you're looking to derive kind of the large scale structure of space time from the local dynamics of these atoms of space. Well, okay, to have dynamics, you have to have some notion of evolution, some notion of actual rewriting, some notion of time. And so that's where graph rewriting comes in, because the idea is what's happening is there's just a, a, a graph rewriting rule, and that graph rewriting rule is just being applied to this to this hypergraph, and uh, over and over again, building up the structure of the hypergraph, building up essentially the structure of space. Now, there's an important piece to this, which is in in physics, 
the the sort of the, the 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 assumption for the last hundred years has been that space and time are very much the same kind of thing, that you know it's just a uh, you know it's just a Lorentz transformation to get from one to the other type thing, and and the one of the things that happens in these models is that we're breaking that idea. Here, space is the extent of the spatial hypergraph, and time is the progressive computational rewriting of that hypergraph through graph rewriting. And so you might think, well, how can you possibly get relativistic invariance and all those things that we, we know are true in, uh, or seem to be true in, in physics? Well, it turns out the answer is that it all has to do with the fact that we, if we put the observer into the system, that kind of has, it, it looks different than if we kind of look at it from the outside. And in particular, just like I was mentioning earlier, when you put the observer into the system, what you realize is the only thing you actually get to observe is the causal relationships between events in the system. So every graph rewrite is an event and the, you can make a causal graph that represents the relationship between those rewriting events. Essentially, two rewriting events can be are causally related if the output from one of them needs to be used for the input to the next one. And so that generates a partial ordering on, on these uh, uh, rewrites, on, on these updates, and that defines this causal graph that, uh, that represents those things. So then it turns out that the essentially the the uh, maybe I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but the the notion of time has to do with the sort of successive foliation of this causal graph. What counts as being at the same time? You're basically taking a slice through this causal graph, and you're saying I'm going to establish these particular events as being simultaneous in time. But there are many possible foliations you can choose, and the question is, are these foliations equivalent or not? Okay, so then there's this property of causal invariance, which is true for certain rewriting rules, which has the implication that the the that whatever the underlying order of rewritings is, you'll always get the same causal graph. These these all everything that could happen in the actual underlying rewriting sequences can be generated by some foliation of the causal graph. And it turns out that is equivalent to the statement of special relativity. Okay, so next interesting fact is that, so we've got this idea of space, we've got this idea of time. So now the question is, well, what about uh, space-time? What about the structure of space-time? What about uh, things like Einstein's equations? Well, so the first issue is when we have um, one of these, uh, um, well, let, let me first of all, just, just sort of show a little bit about, um, uh, let's see, oh, there we go. So there's a, there's a typical, you know, graph rewrite. And uh, we just run that a bunch of times. Um, that's kind of the behavior we might get. Uh, the question is, can we characterize the creature that comes out here? We, we could try different graph rewritings. Here's kind of a collection, of a zoo of different graph rewriting results. This is kind of just sort of in the explore the computational universe of graph rewritings. This is the kinds of things that you get. So the question is, um, can you? how do you characterize these results? Well, here's an example of a particular graph rewriting uh, sequence that uh, after a while generates um, this kind of thing, which you can see kind of is looks like just a grid. It looks like just a two-dimensional grid. And that that kind of gives one a clue. And one can one can look at different kinds of things here. One can look at here's another graph rewriting. This on a large scale, when we render it, it gives something like this. So how do we characterize this? Well, first thing we can do is characterize what is the effective dimension of the large scale limit of this graph rewriting, the long time limit of this graph rewriting process. And uh, so we're not talking about, obviously we can, we can draw the graph however we want. What is the sort of a more invariant characterization of the effective dimension of this graph? So the way to think about that is you just start at a node in the graph and you just go a graph distance R away from that node and you simply ask what is the growth rate of the GD ball that you create by doing that. And then you just say that growth rate you identify as being R to the D, where D is the effective dimension of this limiting graph. So you can do that for all kinds of, you can just measure the effective dimensions of these kinds of limiting graphs. And you know, for something like this, the effective dimension is two. Um, for something, you know, for some kind of fractally thing, the effective dimension is, is the standard Hausdorff dimension and so on. But you can make those kinds of measurements for, for any one of these systems. But you can also 
uh, when you start asking about the volume of this geodesic ball, it's not precisely R to the D. It's R to the D with some correction terms. Just like, you know, you draw a, a circle on a sphere, its area is not just pi R squared. It has a correction term proportional to the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the radius of the, eventually the curvature of the sphere. So you can do the same kinds of things for these, these uh, graphs or hypergraphs in their geodesic balls. You can ask what's the, uh, what's the correction to the growth rate. The correction to the growth rate is proportional to the Ricci scalar curvature of the sort of limiting manifold that you get from these kinds of systems. So it gets a little bit more elaborate when you, th when you think about space time, but the result is that you're effectively looking at the um, uh, Ricci tensor projected into some direction, and that's limiting volumes of, uh, limiting growth rates of volumes of cylinders and things in the kind of, in, oh, I should have said in the, in the causal graph rather than, these are, these are just uh, graphs that you get from sort of the instantaneous um, update of, uh, the, at a particular sort of moment in time. The causal graph is what you're getting. Well, here's an example of a causal graph showing those are events, those yellow things are events, and this shows the causal relationships between a bunch of events. Um, and uh, so, uh, okay, so, so in any case, you can, you can get this kind of, um, um, uh, you're, you're, you're looking at what is the large scale limit of these causal graphs, and uh, you end up finding out that uh, you can characterize it in terms of dimension, in terms of curvature, and so on. And then you ask the question, um, when there's causal invariance, when you pick sort of reasonable foliations of the system, what is the effective behavior that you see for the structure of space-time implied by the large-scale limit of these graphs? And very nicely, it turns out to be Einstein's equations. And in a sense, the derivation is similar in spirit to the derivation of, uh, of, of fluid mechanics from discrete molecular dynamics. Um, essentially what's happening is you're saying, um, if there's enough kind of effective randomness in the system and certain kinds of features are, are true in the system, then the large scale limit can be characterized in terms of essentially these PDEs. Where does the randomness come from? Well, the randomness comes from computational irreducibility. There is no randomness. These are deterministic systems, but computational irreducibility gives you something that for practical purposes is that, that, that has the sort of appropriate statistical properties that you need to derive these kinds of things. There's a, there's a little bit of extra twiddle that's actually a very, very important extra twiddle having to do with the thing that I was sort of glossing over about reasonable foliations, which turns out to be deeply related, I think, to, to the way that sort of uh, observers like us observe the universe. Um, maybe I shouldn't get into that particular particular issue. I mean, the basic point is, well, it, it relates. It's a. It, it turns out the second law of thermodynamics and the Einstein equations both rely on an important fact, which is the second law of thermodynamics is in a sense a story of computational irreducibility, because what it's saying is in the second law of thermodynamics you're saying you start off with this bunch of molecules, they're all bouncing around, and you say even though I start them in what seems to me like a very ordered state after a while, they will seem to me to be in a completely disordered state. But seem to me means with my kind of computationally bounded ability to observe what's going on with these molecules, they'll seem random. But the reason they seem random is because essentially computational irreducibility has encrypted the, the, the kind of configuration of these molecules so that I as a sort of computationally bounded observer can't untangle that. And it's the same kind of thing in the universe that sort of space time at a microscopic scale has all this computational irreducibility, but we as sort of computationally bounded observers can only sort of see these slices of computational reducibility. And that ends up being the Einstein equations, just as in the case of, a, of statistical mechanics and a gas, it ends up being sort of the, the, uh, the uh, fluid dynamics and things like this. Okay. I can see I'm going a bit more slowly than I expected, but, but um, well, let, let me just say that, that, um, uh, it's all very, very cute, the way that um, uh, this is a string rewriting system. There's just a, a, a thing that rewrites BA to AB. These are the events. You can draw causal graphs here. You can see that this is a causal invariant system where it doesn't matter what the microscopic uh, sort of when you do each rewrite, you'll always get the same causal graph. If you are an observer of that system, you try and sort of make up moments in time. They make up these sort of simultaneity surfaces in time. And if you make up different simultaneity surfaces, 
you will sort of uh, uh, connect these in, in order to have the simultaneity surfaces, in order to sort of uh, structure these simultaneity surfaces in this kind of way, you end up with essentially directly Lorentz transformations and so on. You can kind of, it's kind of cute that you can see this. This is kind of the um, sort of at rest, what you might see is sort of the maximal rewriting of the system. But if we now say that we're going to make a, uh, a foliation in which we're effectively uh, traveling at some speed across the system, the system, the, uh, uh, the rewrites are, will effectively happen more slowly. We'll end up with the same result, but it'll happen more slowly. In a sense, what's happening is we have a certain sort of computation budget uh, about what's happening in the system. And we can either use that computation budget to just evolve the system in time, or we can use that computation bu budget to change our position in space. If we're using some computation budget to change our position in space, time is running more slowly, and that's what leads to time dilation in, in relativity, which is kind of cool. Um, okay, so anyway, you can you can um, construct all these causal graphs. You can uh, you can start talking about these kinds of things. In um, one of the other important results is the identification of energy with essentially activity in the network. So, graph rewriting. It's like what is energy uh, for your purposes? Since you're into graph rewriting, energy is the intensity of graph rewriting that's happening in the universe. Um, and more formally, it's the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. Uh, space-like hypersurface is the thing that we're drawing that is sort of the consistent uh, slice of an instantaneous moment in time in the system. So, so activity in the network is identified with energy. Uh, momentum is the flux of these causal edges through time-like surfaces. Um, but um, uh, and you can derive e equals mc squared and all those kinds of cool things. Um, but uh, uh, perhaps more interesting is what the presence of energy in this system, uh, the presence of energy causes, among other things, the deflection of GD6, the deflection of shortest paths in, this, um, in the evolving hypergraph. And the reason that's important is that the deflection of, of GD6 is kind of the sign of... of uh, uh, of the presence of gravity in space-time. And so effectively what's being said is in these models, it is indeed true and we can derive the, the standard form of the Einstein equations that says that among other, that, that says that energy momentum causes <clears throat> causes curvature, curvature, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> curvature is deflects JD6. And so in a sense, the graph rewriting activity produces deflection in GD6 in these hypergraphs. And that's basically the statement that there's gravity and that gravity deflects, uh, GD6 deflects the paths of objects. Okay, so that's, um, that's sort of a bit of the story of space time. So, okay, so here's the next important thing in our models. The next important thing which, uh, is all we're saying is it's all graph rewriting. And we're saying, whenever you see a piece of graph that looks like this, rewrite it to one that looks like this. Well, crucial fact is that you all know very well, I think, um, is that that isn't a, there may be many possible ways to do that rewriting. It is not the case that there's, it may be in some specific examples, there may be just a single possible sequence of rewritings, but most of the time, there are many possible rewritings. There are many possible sequences of rewritings that can be applied to the graph. And so what that means is that instead of getting a sort of definite deterministic history of evolution, we have a multi-way graph. And, and so the multi-way graph here represents, these are possible graph rewritings that um, uh, can be done. So let's see, I have a bigger picture of that. Um, uh, gosh, where is it? Um, the uh, uh, maybe here, yeah. So, so this is so. So here, uh, here's a particular sequence of graph rewritings that are being done, and this is the multi-way graph that represents all possible histories of graph rewriting. Important feature of this is so here, for example, there are two possible rewrites that you can do on that graph with the underlying rule that's used here. So there's a branch in the multi-way graph. Crucial fact is there are both branches in the multi-way graph and merges in the multi-way graph. So in a sense, that sort of forces an entanglement 
of these kinds of um, uh, possible configurations of in, in, uh, the states in the multiway graph. Okay, so what's the interpretation of this multiway graph? Well, it's really an important thing because it's quantum mechanics, basically. So in classical physics, the sort of main idea is you have a deterministic equation of motion, for example, the, the, your system does a definite thing. You throw a ball, it goes in a definite trajectory. In quantum mechanics, sort of the core idea is definite things aren't what happen. The, you follow sort of all the paths in the path integral and you get to say what the amplitudes or ultimately probabilities of different things that might have happened are. So what we're seeing here is from the idea of graph rewriting, from the idea that you're just specifying rewrites of graphs, we're sort of forced into quantum mechanics. We're forced to talk about our system as being a multi-way system. And so then the question is, okay, so can we actually fill in the details of what this, uh, what this means for quantum mechanics? Um, and uh, the answer is yes, and it's all very beautiful. Um, and uh, let's see, I mean, we can start thinking just like we talked about, this is now a string rewriting system, but you're making a multi-way graph from this, just as we talked about uh, sort of understanding, uh, we talked about reference frames for making sense of the structure of space-time. Similarly, we need the analog of reference frames, we call them quantum observation frames, for making sense of the structure of things in the multi-way graph. So the first thing to understand is when we look at this multi-way graph, um, the uh, we can ask, okay, so each of these possible things is essentially a quantum state of the universe. So what's happening is the universe starts in some state, then there are two different quantum states that can be produced. And what we see here is uh, uh, this, if we're doing this slicing, this quantum observation frame, it's giving us a superposition of these three possible states of the, of the universe. And so what's then, what one thing we can then ask is, okay, well, just as if we if this was a causal graph and we were foliating our causal graph, if we look at slices of the causal graph, the structure of slices of the causal graph represents space. So a given a given slice of the causal graph, the way that the elements are connected there is a representation of the structure of space. So the question is, what's the analogous thing here? And the analogous thing is what we call branchial space. It's a space of quantum branches. It's something that gives you the sort of a map of entanglements between quantum states. So for example, here, this is the successive steps. This is showing uh, two, two nodes are joined here if they have a common ancestor on the step before. It's one possible criterion one can use. And so this is saying, this is the structure. This is essentially a map of entanglements between quantum states. And so what we're seeing is, if we make take this sort of foliation of the, of the multi-way graph, we're seeing something where we're seeing not physical space, we're seeing some other kind of thing. We're seeing this thing we call branchial space. Okay, so, so the, basically the idea is that uh, quantum mechanics is when we make observations, measurements and things in quantum mechanics, we're, we're doing things with these quantum observation frames. But the, the important thing is that the kind of the map of what's possible is given by this, this branchial structure. And so we can ask questions like, uh, so, so we have this whole uh, multi-way graph and the slices through it are branchial graphs that represent the map of entanglements between quantum states. And so uh, one thing we can ask is, what's the interpretation? So in, in standard quantum mechanics, one thinks about every quantum state has a certain quantum amplitude. Well, quantum amplitudes are complex numbers. What are the complex numbers in this system? Turns out, I think another mistake we think that was sort of made in the history of physics was the bundling of the magnitudes and phases of, of, of quantum amplitudes together as individual complex numbers, because we think the magnitudes come from a different place than the phases. We think the magnitudes come from essentially path counting in the multi-way graph, and the phases are positions in branchial space. This is something we've spent a bunch of effort trying to understand is the coordinatization of branchial space. That is how things should best be laid out in branchial space. And in physical space, when we're slicing the multi-way graph, uh, so, sorry, slicing the causal graph, we have a pretty good understanding of how that limits to Euclidean, you know, to manifolds, which are locally Euclidean and all these kinds of things. We don't have a similar understanding in, in the case of multi-way graphs in branchial space.
but essentially the, the position in branchial space seems to be the phase of the quantum amplitude. So why is that important? Well, it's important because when we think about the time evolution of systems here, what's ending up happening is we're essentially following a path through the multi-way graph, and that path moves around in branchial space. So we effectively have quantum evolution is essentially motion in branchial space. And then the big fact is that we can, there's a notion of energy, which is the same thing. It's a flux of causal edges, AKA the intensity of graph rewriting essentially in, in this, uh, in the multi-way graph. And you can, you can end up with, um, and so that, that sort of intensity of rewriting turns out to be the cause of the deflection of JD6 in the multi-way graph. And so what that's saying is when there's in the presence of energy, effectively, the there is the GD6, the, the, the sort of in this multi-way graph are deflected, which means things move around in branchial space. What does that mean? That means they change their quantum phase. And what is that? Why is that significant? Well, a core, a core representation of quantum mechanics is the Feynman path integral, which says that the which gives you basically the quantum phase being proportional to the action, which is essentially a relativistically invariant analog of energy. And so what this is essentially saying is that just from the structure of these graphs and so on, we're deriving the fact that this, this Feynman path integral, the fact that there's a deflection of GD6 in branchial space, that uh, deflection of GD6 in this multi-way graph, which is essentially motion in branchial space that is associated with the presence of energy. So, okay, bottom line for all of that is something that I think is just a, a, a wonderful thing, that the Einstein equations are a story of the deflection of GD6 in physical space. The path integral, which is the Einstein equations, sort of the core of relativity. The, Einstein, the, the in the in in branchial space, the analogous thing is there's a deflection of GD six, and that corresponds to the Feynman path integral. So it's basically saying that the Einstein equations are the direct analog of the Feynman path integral, except the Einstein equations operate in physical space, and the Feynman path integral operates in branchial space. So that these two fundamental theories of of uh, 20th century physics are actually the same theory. And, and they're both things that sort of you can think of at some level in terms of your favorite graph rewriting kinds of, kinds of ideas. So, okay, so let me not go into this in more detail. Probably Jonathan has talked about this. An important feature of, of the multi-way graph is the way that one can understand that uh, in terms of, well, Jonathan and, and friends have understood it, particularly in terms of categorical quantum mechanics. Um, but uh, uh, the main point is, just the multi-way graph is sufficient to give you all kinds of features of quantum mechanics. You don't, it, it, even if the things you were rewriting weren't graphs, you could still get lots of features of, of ordinary quantum mechanics. If you want to go at quantum field theory, you have to get, a, you have to actually deal with the spatial extent of things and you actually have to deal with these spatial hypergraphs and the rewriting of spatial hypergraphs. And we're just in the early phases of understanding how that all works. And one of the places where branchial space and physical space kind of intersect is in, in black holes, um, and there's lots to say about that. All right, well, so basically, I mean, I would say that, that um, uh, the things have been going just outstandingly well with this model of physics. And I, you know, I, I had said my expectation was we'd get to the first 10 to the minus 1,000 seconds of the universe, and we wouldn't be able to get any further. Um, the thing that I missed is the following phenomenon, that the, the whole story of the underlying updating of, of, of graphs with, with you know, these, these rules and so on, that's a story of computational irreducibility. But the most surprising meta fact about the universe is that there are definite laws that we know in the universe. So there has to be some, there, there's some regularity to the universe. There's some computational reducibility to the universe. And the thing that we've discovered is that there are two big slices of computational reducibility that kind of sit on top of this irreducibility that's happening at the lowest level. Those two big slices are basically relativity and quantum mechanics. And so in a sense, the at the lowest level, there's all this graph rewriting going on and it's very, you know, it's incomprehensible, but there are sort of these, these overall features that are identifiable. And those overall features, the fact that there are these identifiable overall features, uh, probably has very deep origins in sort of the category theory or other ways to think about these kinds of things. I'll mention just one, one consequence of that, and, and then, I, then I want to talk about some other features of graph rewriting, and then I should wrap up. Um, the, um, 
uh, one of the things about, about these models that is, okay, we're saying there is some rule and you keep on applying it, you apply it 10 to the however many hundreds of times and you get our universe. You might say, well, why is it that rule and not another rule? So what you realize is that actually there's a more general version of this that we can call the ruleal multi-way graph, where instead of just saying we apply a particular rule in all possible places, you say we apply all possible rules in all possible places. And you might say, how could that ever give you anything interesting? But in fact, this ruleal multi-way graph has a very rich structure. I mean, I've studied it particularly, let's see, I studied it for Turing machines. Um, you can study sort of the ruleal limit of Turing machines. And um, uh, it, it looks like the kind of, we can, we can think about it mathematically as something like the infinity groupoid is sort of this limiting thing that you get from this sort of limiting ruleal multi-way graph. So uh, why is this interesting? Well, uh, I think it's interesting because I think it shows us, uh, among other things, just to, to jump in a, in a very bizarre direction that I'm about to uh, uh, post a piece about, that I think it shows us why the universe exists and why one essentially inevitably goes from, why one can go from sort of the inevitability of a collection of formal rules to uh, something which, as read by an observer, necessarily has certain structure that, that corresponds to what we see in the universe. But the, this will get us into a, 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 a rabbit hole of, of infinite depth. But in any case, the main point is that there's this idea of ruleal multiway systems, which generalizes further this notion of, of just do graph rewriting wherever you want. It's just do any rewriting with any uh, graph rewrite. And I think there's interest, a very interesting mathematical structure there. And I think, um, so, and by the way, I think that the um, this whole question about how the ruleal multiway graph works is deeply related to sort of the limit of metamathematics. I've studied a bunch the kind of graph of I don't know theorem dependencies in Euclid and things like this and the kind of human geography of of, of empirical metamathematics. But I think there's a there's sort of a a general set of things that can be said that have quite a lot of implication for sort of foundations of mathematics. Well. Okay, so we're really excited about what this is saying about physics, and it really looks like we're going to reach the point where we can, well, already, particularly through Jonathan's work, we, we found out that even though we thought, I thought, this would be far away from having any sort of immediate applications, we found that the actual methodology uh, is useful for doing numerical relativity, for actually computing black hole mergers and things, and also for doing quantum circuit optimization, for doing practical things in quantum information theory. And we have at least suggestions for potential experimental directions that can be gone to, to find out, you know, to actually nail down for sure the universe is just a giant graph rewriting exercise. But one of the things, let me just mention that um, uh, sort of I've been excited about beyond this is the formalism that we have here about uh, sort of graph rewriting, multi-way systems, these kinds of things, that formalism seems to have application even beyond physics. You know, we built this for physics, but it seems to have application in other areas. And what's really interesting about those applications, given that we've applied it to physics, is physics has gone a long way. So we know a lot of stuff in physics about black holes and event horizons and all kinds of features of quantum field theory and so on. And given the f distance we've got in physics, if that is being written, if, if basically the machine code of physics is graph rewriting, we then know things about large scale limits of graph rewriting that we can then apply to other fields. And so the fields that I've been most interested in uh, right now are distributed computing. So I think that there's a way of thinking about, uh, that there's sort of a way of thinking about programming in reference frames and so on and a way of using the ideas from essentially the physicalization of distributed computation to, to have a, a sort of ways to think about that. And there are analogs of lots of physical phenomena in distributed computing, and that kind of helps one understand them. In a few cases, you know, the eventual consistency idea in distributed databases and so on is this is related to our causal invariance idea. Um, and there's, there's lots of relations between these things. Um, I would say that uh, I wanted to mention the um, uh, somehow uh, once you have these kinds of hammers, there are many kinds of nails that you can see. Like I was, uh, it was the hundredth anniversary of the invention of combinators on December seventh, uh, twenty twenty, last year. 
And so I decided, you know, I, I decided I'd, let me look at combinators in, in, in our sort of modern way. And I realized, yes, you can make all these, you know, combinators do all these complicated things. And it's the same story as in the rest of the computational universe. Even though you just have the simple rules of combinators, you can see all kinds of complicated behavior. Um, and you can also start looking at things in terms of multi-way graphs. And uh, someplace here, there should be start to be some multi-way graphs. Um, and then you can start to understand things about evaluation orders in, um, uh, in programs and things um, in terms of these multi-way graphs. And I realized, you know, I had known about combinators when I originally started doing uh, transformation rules for symbolic expressions. And uh, I think I used essentially every idea in combinators except the idea that there are no names for anything. And um, the, uh, what I realized in a sense is that the whole model that we're trying to use for the universe, it's sort of embarrassing for me because in a sense, it's the same kind of model as the model that I've had for computation, the model that I've had for sort of human understandable computation of just these uh, transformation rules on symbolic expressions, except that when we do it to make computational language, we have names for the nodes effectively. We're, we, you know, that's a plus, that's a times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we're doing is, and, and uh, what, we're, what we're saying for our models of physics is, no, these are just pure structure, just nodes without names. They just have an identity, they don't have names, and there are 10 to the 400 of them. And so it's essentially taking the limit you might think, and you might think about doing that in applications of graph rewriting as well, where you say, this is a graph I'm rewriting, and this particular thing means this particular thing. Well, in getting to physics, we're considering the bulk limit where the elements of the graph don't in the, on their own mean anything. They're just atoms of space. But the large scale limit has structure that, that we, can, uh, we can try to recognize. So I think this is relevant to a lot of things. I think it's relevant to uh, some of the places that I'm particularly interested right now. Um, I think it's in interesting for chemistry. I think that obviously we know that these multi-way graphs are like reaction networks. And essentially what we're doing when we try and find, do chemical synthesis is we're doing sort of the theorem proving of finding a particular path through this network. One of the things I think is interesting is thinking about chemical processes and particular molecular scale computation in terms of not saying, I want one particular answer for one particular path, but I'm going to trace the whole multi-way graph of what's going on, and I'm going to use that as my answer. Now, I think that we humans are poorly equipped. I think it's sort of a core feature of the way that consciousness works, that we end up making up this idea that there's sort of a single thread of time, there's a single thread of experience. And so I think that's sort of why it's hard to think about distributed computing is because we humans are really built in, in many of the things we do to sort of sequentialize things in time. And that's been sort of the, the way one's usually thought about things like chemical synthesis, but I think that there's a, a, a sort of way to think about these kinds of things that where you just take, uh, where you think about sort of the multi-way process as the answer, so to speak, rather than thinking about a particular state generated on a particular path as the answer. And I have the suspicion that this is deeply relevant to biology. I mean, in the history of biology, the sort of, if you look before the 1950s, you know, people were doing genetics and they had all kinds of complicated phenomena and so on. And then they realized it all fits together when we think about, you know, digital information and DNA. There's a lot of stuff in systems biology where there's just lots of different facts that are known. And the question is, is there sort of a big picture that knits these together? And I have this sneaking suspicion that this idea of sort of multi-way computation is the kind of thing that is the sort of the paradigmatic way to think about sort of the molecular computing that happens in biology, um, not in terms of sort of this, this one thing causes another type of thing. And just to not, not to um, over, overburden this, but I, I'm, um, uh, the other area that I think this is highly relevant to is, is economics. Um, again, very un, unformed uh, work, but we've been we've been working quite a bit on distributed blockchain, on using on using these kinds of ideas to and ideas from things like quantum mechanics to understand how to make sort of an analog of blockchain that isn't just a single ledger being produced. And so that that's uh, that's kind of another application of these kinds of things. And I've gone on much longer than I than I intended, but but I suppose the main um, um, the main thing that I wanted to communicate is. Uh, there's just a lot of interesting stuff to get from graph rewriting. And, uh, you know, we've ended up 
looking at a corner of graph rewriting that is probably bizarre to many people. That is, it is graph rewriting in bulk of kind of, and the natural history of graph rewriting. I mean, I've, I've, I've written this big thing, which you can find about the structure of these models where I've kind of really tried to catalog some of the things that just happen in the rewriting of hypergraphs and what kinds of, what the, what the kind of natural history of, of the species of, of things that happen is. And so anyway, we've sort of been looking at these kind of large scale limits there are, there are just so many questions that, that arise and so many things that I suspect can be addressed by some of the things that, that I think you guys have been interested in. And uh, uh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what, uh, what, what if I understood the literature better, what we could actually do to, uh, uh, for our models and so on, and what we could do for some of the applications. And perhaps it will be useful to you guys that you can, by making these connections, particularly to physics, you can get to leverage a bunch of results that have been generated in physics to try to understand more about kind of large scale structure of graph rewriting and so on. All right, let me wrap up there and uh, happy to have whatever discussion questions or anything else uh, people want to, want to raise. Thanks. Excellent, thank you very much, Stephen. So thanks for that exciting talk. Um, uh, maybe I kick off with a, with, a, with a question, a sort of general question, and then we let people sort of ask more questions in the chat. So, um, or maybe just a comment. So what I see here is really sort of a big project coming up, trying to understand the, the, the sort of the, 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 the possible alignment of the concepts in, in, in the different areas. I mean, obviously you're coming from a particular motivation uh, which is very broad, but 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 still a specific motivation of look of, of using graph rewriting, whereas graph rewriting has evolved in 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 a number of domains in, in in with different motivations has come with its come up with its own terminology and its own concepts, and I think we're probably just beginning to understand how how one maps to the other. So there may be questions that you have that have already been answered. There may be questions that could trigger new. Yep. new science on our end and, and 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 the other way around so i think that's a really interesting exercise and i mean we've scheduled yeah, I mean, a session with sorry yeah yeah no no to make the dictionary that the you know the translation between what's been done in graph rewriting and what we've tried to do will be super useful and i know jonathan has started on that and interacted with a number of people here yeah, and yeah. you know I, I I think what we're going to find is a bunch of concepts have been you know invented in both places some concepts are missing in one place and were important in the other place. And I think that will be super productive. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I maybe I'll finally understand things like double push out rewriting and so on, which I've, I've had a, which I think are the same as something I've, I used to do, but I don't really know. And, um, but uh, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I it, it always helps us that, and sort of being core to the methodology of what we've done, that we're doing all these computer experiments and we're able to visualize things and, and all the tools that we have are all sort of openly available and so on. And you'll find all these, all these things that I've been writing, at least you can, you can click on any picture and you will, it'll copy the code that you can just run to generate that picture. And um, uh, I think that may be true of Jonathan's papers as well. I'm not sure how, how, how true that is. I, I may have been able to, to corral more people into helping with making that work than Jonathan has been able to so far. The, but yes, no, I mean, the, the, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, and maybe if people ask here, how does this, you know, how does feature X in, in graph rewriting relate to our stuff? I might or might not be able to answer immediately, but that is the, that's the interesting homework, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to say we've scheduled, uh, I don't know whether we have scheduled, but we're planning a, a discussion session with, with Jonathan and some other people around around these topics. So maybe we can That's pick great. up some of the more technical questions there and at least get pointers and, and then try to explore that in the more detail. So so I had a, a, a not, not really a technical question, but a, maybe a more, more conceptual question about, um, which I also posted on the chat in the hope that someone might sort of miraculously answer it, but <laughs> no one did. Um, so um, it's about the notion of observer. You said the observer is part of the system, or that's an assumption that you're making, that the observer is part of the system. So I didn't get the technical sense of what you mean okay, by that. You, this you don't is, this mean is a that... deep story, okay? This is not a simple story. So first point is, if one's in the business of modeling all of physics, it better be the case that we're part of what's being modeled. That's the, that's the first statement. I mean, it, it's, it's inevitable that the observer must be part of the system if you're modeling all of physics. Uh, 
Mm. Now the question is, what is the observer? What characteristics does the observer have? And how important are the characteristics of the observer in what the observer observes? Okay, and this is something I've understood better more recently. And the 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 question is, you know, in the universe, we've got all these atoms of space, so they're all getting rewritten in all these complicated ways. But we as observers are, we can't, you know, all those details are not what we detect, so to speak. It's similar to, th think about the case of statistical mechanics, where you've got a bunch of gas molecules bouncing around in a box. The typical observer of those molecules is a macroscopic being, so to speak, who only sees the average density of the gas molecules, doesn't see every detail of where each gas molecule goes. You would come to very different conclusions about statistical mechanics if you could see and trace every detail. You would not. You would conclude that the second law of thermodynamics isn't true because all the, the, the evolution will be reversible. You can trace every, every step. You wouldn't say that you know, entropy seems to increase or anything like that. The reason you say entropy seems to increase is because you're coarse graining your observation of the system. You're saying, I only look at these kind of large scale features. So in a sense, the, the properties of the observer in, in statistical mechanics, the properties of the observer are the story of coarse graining. But one can generalize that idea. And the generalization of that idea is it's a computationally bounded observer. That is, the observer is not able to trace every single thing that every gas molecule is going to do, not able to watch all of those things. The observer is just doing some computationally bounded kind of um, uh, aggregation of what's happening in the system. So first, first point is the assumption that observers are computationally bounded. I think that's a pretty inevitable assumption because I think if you don't have, well, okay, so let's, okay, let's assume co observers are computationally bounded. The second thing, which I think turns out to be critical in our models, is observers believe that there is a definite thread of time. Now, that might not be true. We could imagine some bizarre aliens that don't have that idea. We have that idea. And, and in fact, the whole sort of story of what people identify, you know, in in clinical medicine as consciousness and all kinds of other things. It's all about sort of integrating what's going on into this kind of um, thread of this, this sort of progressive thread of things happening in time. And we see that in, in the structure of human language as well. It's a sequential kind of thing. So I think it's a key feature of observers like us that we sequentialize things in time. So then those two properties, sequential, sequentializing in time and computationally bounded, those two properties then imply all kinds of things about what you can actually observe in causal graphs and so on. And so in particular, they imply that these foliations that you pick of what corresponds to simultaneity in time can't be terribly wild. If they were, you wouldn't have computational boundedness. And the fact that you even are picking foliations is a consequence of the sequentiality in time. So I think what happens is that the fact that we conclude that the universe is following general relativity is a consequence of the fact that we are observers of a certain type. If we were different kinds of observers, if we were multi-threaded time observers um, that were somehow not computationally bounded, we wouldn't see relativity. Just as if we were observers in a gas who were sensitive to every particular gas molecule and, and measured other kinds of things, we wouldn't observe the second law of thermodynamics. So the fact that we observe what we observe about the universe is a consequence of certain general features of our kind of observer uh, characteristics. And I, and I think, you know, characterizing what kind of observers we are. Okay, so in the quantum mechanical case, it's a little bit more mind twisting, I think, because I think the way to think about it there, the universe is branching in this multi-way graph. We are embedded in that branching universe. So what does that mean? That means that our minds are also branching. And so what essentially the, the question of, of quantum mechanics is, how does a branching brain observe a branching universe? And actually, Jonathan has a nice way of, of understanding what's going on there in terms of completions and lemmas and theorem proving and so on. But, but the basic idea is what, what you're doing is as soon as you make the assumption that there's a single thread of time that forces that assumption about being an observer forces a bunch of features of quantum mechanics and basis he forces one to conclude that the universe works according to the laws of quantum mechanics. If you didn't have that point of view, if you said, well, my brain is branching, 
And I'm just going to, I'm not going to bring those branches together. I'm just going to let those branches be separate. I mean, I think the, the case that sort of the extreme cases, imagine you're an intelligence that's, uh, uh, you know, where two parts of your brain are on opposite sides of an event horizon, uh, you know, at the, at the edge of a black hole or something. In that case, you can't bring the two sides together. And so you, you can't make the kind of, well, you, it, it, it's again, it's a, it's a complicated thing to think through, but, but basically the idea is that because of these two characteristics, computational boundedness and sequentiality in time, those two features of observers basically reach back into defining how the laws of physics have to work. And that's, and that's the, um, so that's, that's what it means, quotes, to be an observer, I think. I mean, those are the two characteristics that are true in the, about the generalized human observer. You know, one could imagine, you know, the the aliens one could imagine would violate one of those conditions, in which case I claim they would not observe the same laws of physics. By the way, even if you're observing the same laws of physics, the the kind of the the this sort of reference frame in this rulial space, the the attribution of what rules actually apply to the universe can be utterly different. So you can end up with sort of a completely incoherent view of what the, how the universe is built even though some characteristics have to ultimately be the same. Anyway, that, that's, that's, it, this is a complicated subject. I mean, I, I just wrote this post actually about um, the nature of consciousness and its role and its relationship to what observers are, which um, uh, at least I'm, I'm happy to see the philosophers seem to like. Um, I don't know about, uh, and uh, um, the, uh, that's, um, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with the one that I'm just actually going to post today about why the universe exists. That one is, uh, I've been testing that with some philosophers and, and so far the main response is that's interesting. So that's, that's a good start. Um, all right, let's see. We had some other, other questions maybe here. Yeah, Paolo had a question. Uh, Nicholas, what use to phases if not to cancel out an impact on amplitude? Yeah, and Nicholas had some hypothesis on that. Nicholas, maybe can you... Is, it, is the question clear? Can you, do you want to answer it like well, that? Well, let me just see that I understand it. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to unmute to Pablo if he's still here and wants to maybe ask the question directly. Yeah. Pablo yeah, seems to be there. Pablo? Uh, can you hear me? Just yeah. about. You're a little distant, but, but yes, we can just okay. about hear you. Great. Uh, no, I was just uh, wanting to have some details about these... Uh, these phases things so first of all um, on this question of bundling them with amplitudes or not yes i have this uh, uh, perhaps naive question but uh, to me the very reason why you have uh, phases is because they may cancel out and if that's that's why you like them and uh, if they do then they will have an impact on amplitudes if they are bundled with them uh, so that's, that, that was the, the meaning of my question. Okay. Now, so, I mean, perhaps uh, sub, uh, yeah. other questions also is, where do these phases come from? Can you generate them uh, in a local manner? That would be uh, perhaps uh, uh, something you would hope for. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay, this is complicated. Jonathan has much better answers to this, but let me tell you, I mean, what I was giving you was a kind of intuition level description. Okay, the, the, the main thing to say is the, okay, first point is uh, Jonathan and others have made this mapping of our models to categorical quantum mechanics, which is kind of the real way to do this. What I'm giving you is kind of the rough intuition. The real way to understand this is, I think, through this mapping to categorical quantum mechanics. But this, there, there may very well be a, another way to think about this that is more, you know, what, what I'm trying to give you is a more intuitive way to think about it. So I think the way to think about it is you, you have an initial state that you prepare in quantum mechanics. It is a bundle of JD6. They end up going to different places in Bronchial space. And for example, destructive interference comes about because essentially what you thought was a single bundle winds up having being scattered to random different parts of branchial space. And when you observe that, the observer is, doesn't manage to collect. The observer essentially is a, is a bounded extent in branchial space. And the observer 
doesn't separately manage to get all those pieces pulled back together again. And that's why they observe destructive interference. So, I mean, th this is, that's an intuitive picture. It's much, you know, there's a, there's a sort of formal mathematical way to set this up that right now we know best how to do in the context of categorical quantum that's mechanics. Right. But I think that this could be an explanation for uh, entanglement uh, and uh, collapse of an EPR pair, uh, for instance, the, the argument you just mentioned. However, um, interference is something that you can do in a very, very local manner. I mean, you just, uh, just put two, uh, uh, two Hadamard gates, as we would say in, uh -huh. in quantum computing. And so you don't need to have a, to, to, to take into account a limited extent of uh, an observer to, to have interference. Right. Okay. Jonathan, do you want to, do you have a crisp way of, of talking about this? You're probably on mute. Let's see. Can we unmute? Unmute. There we go. I think you're, are you unmuted? No. Uh, okay. Am I now unmuted? You are now unmuted. Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the, well, the, it's important to note that the connection to categorical quantum mechanics was not to develop a theory of interference. It was to sanity check the formalism for interference that we already had. So um, in, in some of the early stuff that we, we put out, uh, we put together this kind of simple mathematical model for how to think about interference, you know, how, specifically how to think about destructive interference in terms of critical pair completion procedures in, in the rewriting system. Because so, you know, as as was mentioned several times, you know, the, these, these branchial graph structures that were being shown, uh, as Stephen said, you, they are effectively showing you critical pair distance. They're showing you common ancestry distance in the multi-way system. Or in the CQM picture, they are showing you which collections of, of uh, microstates are, are not directly related by a monoidal product. So the further away they are from each other in terms of the graph distance, uh, the more distantly they've been rewritten from each other because they, they, they have a more distant, uh, more distant ancestor. So a consequence of that is that when I attempt to do a critical pair completion on a pair of states in that branchial graph, the further away they are, the more information I'm going to lose. Because if, if, if I rewrite, if I, if I perform a completion on two states that are separated by just a single branchial edge, then I'm only performing a completion uh, between a pair of states that differ at the level of one rewrite or maybe two rewrites. Whereas if they're, if they're you know, separated by N branchial edges, they could, be, they could differ by up to two N rewrites. So in general, there's an information loss that is greater at greater branchial distances when I attempt to construct a, uh, a globally confluent and therefore causal invariant uh, rewriting system. And uh, the way we set this up was there was a way to, to, to formulate interference in terms of essentially uh, destructive interference in terms of that loss of information. The thing that we then discovered was that, so these so ZX diagrams, these string diagrams for representing tensor networks of quantum circuits in, in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, um, they have phase information that's that's inbuilt, right? Because the the, the, the Z generators and the X generators have have uh, sort of inbuilt phase information. So we already know a priori how those branchial graphs should be coordinatized because it's there in the actual quantum mechanics. And so all we had to do in the CQM context was to show that the destructive interference you predict from the phases of the ZX diagrams gives you the same answer as the destructive interference you get from the information loss of the critical pair completion, which indeed it seems to do. Um, and, and, we, and we proved, at least for the case of finite dimensional stabilizer quantum mechanics, that the, that, that correspondence is always exact. Um, so that, that's the, there's a slightly more formal way of thinking about it. It's basically information loss as a consequence of critical pair completion. I think the bigger picture here is, you know, we would really like to understand better the coordinatization of branchial space, which in the case of, of hypergraph rewriting is basically the story of how do you map, what is, how do you put, you know, how do you make a space where the points are hypergraphs and what are the distance metrics in that space and, and what is the structure of that space? That's the thing that we, you know, and, and we have this kind of notion of entanglement distance from common ancestry of those hypergraphs. But, you know, that this is this is a thing that is, I think, an interesting mathematical structure and we just, we'd really like to understand it better. And I mean, there are, um, yeah, I mean, that that's the, and we've got, you know, we've got these cases of of quantum mechanics, not quantum field theory. We've got these. Um, uh, we've got particular toy examples like um, two slot interference and so on, where where we can kind of see how this coordination works. But it's a it's a more general mathematical problem, which which we have not resolved. Um, you know, it's a it's a um, it's something still to figure out. Okay, okay. Uh.
Whoops, we're not we're not hearing you, pa Pablo. We're, we're... Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, okay. So thanks. I'm a I'm a chair as well, so I can unmute myself. That's, that's very useful. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I mean. I, I don't see any other fundamental questions, but but, but I had to maybe before we. Oh, yeah. Nick, Nicholas had a question here. It looks like. Yeah, sorry, sorry it because was I, a comment I'm... on the previous question, I think. But yeah, let's sorry. let's let's hear from Nicholas. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. That was a very interesting talk, and of course, also had already the pleasure here in the series to talk, discuss with Jonathan. And so, I mean, we might have some technical discussions at some point in more detail, but I just wanted to maybe make a slight attempt at making more direct contact with what we know in rewriting because. It is not the case that we don't know about systems where we have a lot of rewrites happening at random to many different states. I mean, we have in systems biology, for example, these uh, graph rewriting systems that model biochemical reaction systems. And so in particular, we know precisely how, for example, to formulate a continuous time Markov chain based on random rewrites. Um, but, but the one thing sort of what I'm struggling with is, so am I understanding this correctly that you are not by hand putting in complex amplitudes for these? Yeah, um, we're not. You're not. Right. So you are completely wonder, avoiding complex amplitudes. Yeah. Right. No, there's nothing complex. There's no amplitudes. There's no numbers. I'd be curious, when you say continuous time Markov chains, so, you know, is so, what so you're it, imagining there that the rewrite, that you're actually, you have a time coordinate for the rewrite, because we don't have any time coordinates. We're just saying all we have is a partial ordering of rewrites. Um, so you're saying have a specific you know, the rewrite happens at time 1.7 seconds or something. Mm -hmm. And and then you're uh -huh, saying... But, yeah, yeah, but sorry, but exactly, so that's a misunderstanding. So, I mean, of course, that's a viewpoint from a concrete realization. That is one trace. One trace would say sequence of time points being randomly distributed and so on. Right. The, the actual mathematics tells you you have a differential equation that tells you how at a given continuous time point, the likelihood is of a next step to happen within for, for a jump. So you can assign a random, basically you have real parameters of rates, the base rates, but then that's dependent on the possibilities to apply the rules. So essentially we know about these systems that happen completely sort of at random, but then you look at the probability distribution of all realizations. So that's essentially for us like a rule-based Markov chain. And I was just wondering, trying to relate to your, your branch of the space, I have sort of a vague feeling what you are doing might be, you, you as you say, you don't decide any, any semantics for the jumps to happen, which is sort of what I'm trying to understand. You, you don't decide the next rule to apply at some time point, at some step or so. So, so, so my guess is what you're, I mean, the, the, the obvious interpretation of what you're saying is it would give some kind of mean field theory of these kinds of rewriting processes in the sense that you're assuming, you know, you say consider all possible rewritings and then probably your system of differential equations, probably the first order of that is an independence, uh, assumes certain kinds of statistical independence. And maybe there's a whole hierarchy, like in statistical mechanics, there'd be the BBGKYR hierarchy, mm -hmm. for example, which would give you this whole hierarchy of things with more and more correlations. But my guess is, and that would actually be very interesting to us, yeah. that, you know, that the first order would be some kind of mean field theory of the essentially multi-way graph mean field theory. Well, so if I may just add one more question, because, or a comment, I don't know. Uh, so we know precisely from these biological systems, because, I mean, their interpretation is that really your actual biological molecules are the carrier of information, but the transformations of these reactions only ask partial information of those. So each rewriting step only is like a partial observation of a piece of the graph to decide what will be the next step. So that's pretty similar. What's not so similar seems to be that here we have like, so essentially the emergent quantities are observing pattern counts, say. For those, then you get ODE systems, but the actual rewriting system evolves, of course, in jumps, I mean, in, in concrete rewrites. Right. So I'm trying to understand where exactly what, if my gut feeling yeah, is yeah. it would be interesting to see the semantics of what, I mean, how do you okay. form your branch of space? That could be quite right. important. Yeah. Right, right, right. Now, so what you're saying is a really interesting case, right? So let's imagine you have macromolecules and you have individual reactions that, that take place on some part of the macromolecule. So, you know, the translation then is the macromolecule is like our whole universe, basically. Each macromolecule is a universe. So, because each macromolecule is like a hypergraph, graph, whatever else. Um, and what you're saying is there are certain moves, there are certain transformations that you make on those, um, on those graphs. Uh, 
And uh, then you're asking, what's the multi-way graph that you get from looking at all those possible transformations? And what I think you're describing is, so for example, one thing you might easily do is compute rate constants, for instance, which you could do you know, in standard chemistry, right? You would be doing that by saying, by just saying each, you, know, you could write down an ODE that describes what's the concentration of each particular kind of macromolecule based on statistical you know, average of ah, but that's but okay. So, but that turns out to be exactly um, sort of say it's the traditional mm -hmm. picture. But that turns out to be only valid for the averages, and so Absolutely. for the higher order moments, it turns out that is really a writing problem. So, I mean, maybe we should discuss it in the in the small technical discussion because right. But, but now I take a moment. Yeah, got me very interested in this. Okay. Yeah. So, so no, but but, but so could you comment quickly on the semantics. So you, you can can you just maybe give a brief idea of how you build up. The concrete sequences. I mean, is there any notion of time, or is it just that you say all possible sequences without any odd notion of time? So where does yeah, time so, come so in these multi-way graphs, what we're doing is we're Thank just you. saying let's let's take. I mean, for for your macromolecules, you might as well take strings. It doesn't need to be graphs. Um, so so you know what we're doing is we're just saying uh, do the rewrite. I mean, here let me let me pull up a picture here. Um, let's say. Let me just find one here. Um, okay, this will be a typical rewrite process, okay? So each, each yellow thing is an event, the blue things are the states, okay? And so what, what I think, and, and now time here is somewhat arbitrarily drawn, right? I could foliate this, this picture in different ways. All I have is a, I do have, um, you know, some partial ordering here that's defined, but so, you know, and I suspect it's the same for your system, but there's, a, but by the way, one of the things I should have said, I forgot to say, um, the, you know, just a, just a meta observation. So cellular automata have been very successful as models of all kinds of things, because they are basically the minimal models that have, you know, space and time burnt into them and work in parallel. So, you know, that's if you if you don't know anything else, that's what you're going to do. Now, these models that we're dealing with here are essentially, I think, the minimal models that don't have a notion of time and don't have a notion of space. And that's kind of why they're applying in all these places is because they are the minimal models of that. And you can go and add a lot more hair to them if you want to. But that, that's, you know, that's going to be the starting point for lots of kinds of models of things. But, but just to say here, I mean, so what you're saying is, you're saying assume that each event here happens with some rate. So, so say, assume that, you know, for example- That's kind of on, on, on the graph, yes, just to be sure. <laughs> what's that? The, the, the rate is depending on the on the graph because okay. it changes well, dynamically. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. But I don't think you even 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 without that, you already have a non-trivial question. I mean, you, you're just saying each of these, each possible. I mean, and this is basically our path counting for you know for what we're saying magnitudes of amplitudes is it's we're just saying the you know we're counting paths. So we're saying the rate is the rate constant here, so to speak, is equal for the two different events that can happen. So now what I think you're saying is that you're asking a question, if I, if I want to know the concentration of some particular, you know, the molecule BBBBB or something, mm -hmm. then you could, what, what we would say is, if the rate for every possible update is equal, then it is essentially just the number of paths that you can, by which you can reach that, that, that position in the multiway mm -hmm. system. That will be the weight. Now, I think what you might be saying is that if you look at the distribution of all possible macromolecules, so to speak, at a given time, and maybe with macromolecules, there's a better notion of position in macromolecular space than there is intrinsically for graphs. That is, I mean, I know that, that I mean, we've just implemented in Wolfram language, we have a whole big chemistry subsystem that we've, we've built recently, and we have a bunch of molecular distance measures and so on there, which seem a bit hokey, but but... That there, you know, let's assume that one had a better idea of a natural coordinatization of our branchial space by virtue of the structure of these macromolecules. Then what you're what you're saying is what you have, which is rather interesting, is that in that space of macromolecules, you're saying not only do you have information about what the single local concentration is but you also have correlation information about what, for example, let's say the two-point correlation function in that 
macromolecular space might be. Is that, is that right? So that you can say things like, what's the probability that you have, you know, what are the what are the joint probabilities of different kinds of things there? Is that, that, is that the yeah, kind of thing? Precisely. And I mean, and, and sort of the other big question we are after is, for example, imagine you're just generating tree with a Remy generator. That's one of those possible rewrite systems in your state. You do like just this time Markov chain. You just, you know, go random, even uniform at random. And over time, you can ask what's the number of certain pattern counts in the distribution of all possible states you can reach in your picture and all of these sort of branch ways or whichever. Um, and then, so that's a partial information of a huge structure, but you're only interested in observing that. So, I mean, I think what you're telling us is that you might have possibly some approach to the stochastic path integral for continuous time Markov chains uh, for these very structured rewrite systems. And that, that could be quite an interesting question, I think, independent of physics. Yeah. Right, right, right. No, I mean, just for fun, I can show you, I don't know where I can find it, but but in these in these crazy combinator systems, which are basically tree rewritings, um, mm. I did look at something a little bit like what you were talking about, although I'm not sure how far I got with it. I looked at... Um, Oh gosh, where is it? Um, I looked at particular sub patterns, um, and I looked at God, too many. Oh, here we go. So this is asking the question. So these are these are sub trees, right? Mm -hmm. And this is asking the question: um, How big? I mean, uh, I didn't do this in a very a very interesting way, but this is just, I'm just trying to understand this is the same question. This is asking as a function of time in the rewriting process, uh, what, how, what is the, how many of these kinds of subtrees occur in the tree? Right? Yep. Okay, so what I'm doing here is this is a single instance, this is a single rewrite with a particular rewriting order. And what you're saying is, which is very interesting, if you know, mm -hmm. is you're saying, if I look at the multi way graph, and ask what is the, you know, can I directly compute how many of this kind of subtree I get yes. from the whole multi-way graph? Not, this is just a single instance, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm getting this number, but you're asking, how does this develop for the whole multi-way graph? Yeah, that would be really interesting to see. If yeah, you've got- you don't do this uh, by the whole uh, traces, but just by something like analog of ODEs by sort of looking at how one step can in principle change the pattern counts that gives you sort of a discrete um, differential equation, then you can solve that. So that's why I'm interested to see how you do it, how you do it. <laughs> that would yeah, maybe right. help well, us. I, for, I yeah. think, you know, that, that sounds to me like a master equation from statistical mechanics. Exactly. Yeah. The, right. So, I mean, we were, yeah, we have a stochastic mechanics for, for rewriting systems. So that's right. how we do it. So, but I'm okay. So maybe we should, uh, I, I don't want to hook all the time. So, okay. so but maybe we can discuss. Although I have to mention that one thing Jonathan and I were just trying to do, which is kind of a, a, a bit of a prize in terms of of of, of the uh, continuum limits of rewrite systems, and maybe you know how to do this. Is <laughs> we're trying to figure out um, uh, in the case of a non okay. So in our systems, the effective dimension of the hypergraph can change, right? Because because as you re, as you rewrite it. Okay, so here's the exercise. The exercise: Imagine you start with a very high dimensional hypergraph. And imagine that you're doing essentially stochastic rewrites. You're doing, um, the question is, what is the typical evolution of the dimension of the hypergraph as a function of, you know, as the rewrites proceed, okay? And what we think is that the effective dimension will typically decrease. That is, if you, you start off with a very highly connected thing, which has high effective dimension, and we think that we were trying to work out essentially the mean field theory of, of dimension change in hypergraph. And the reason that's important is that's a model for the early universe, because what we think is that the early universe starts essentially infinite dimensional and then sort of gradually cools to, to and what we want is a kind of, what we want is a model that's analogous to the standard sort of Friedman Robertson Walker model of the, of the later universe, which is a homogeneous isotropic universe. And so what we want is the homogeneous and isotropic, but dimension changing, uh, limiting hypergraph. And so I suspect that there's a way of, which we just failed to be able to see. There's a way of using something like master equation formalism or something to understand, but it, it's a slightly weird thing because it's not a purely local property of the graph that you're interested in. You're interested in this thing where you're ultimately trying to compute the dimension of the graph, which is a which is a property that depends on these growth rates of GDC balls and so on. So it's not like in a case like this, you're looking specifically at a, you know, 
at a very, very local property of the graph. So the question is, is there a way of, of making a similar kind of uh, continuous stochastic-like evolution equation for, for something that relates to the large-scale structure of the graph? So anyway, that, that was just a, if you know how to do that, that would be thrilling to us because, um, because the, the, um, uh, that was a, a problem we, we, were, we were just working on a couple of weeks ago and, and not able to solve. And, 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 and yeah. you know, we, we do this strange thing in this project where a bunch of our working sessions we live stream. So people, so the, the embarrassment of us not being able to solve it is, is for all to see. <laughs> um, but uh, the, uh, Anyway, I mean, uh, maybe maybe uh, you might have seen this. We invited you also for this uh, working session. If you can make it, uh, I'll, I'll send again the link. It's yeah, yeah, please. Sometime no, I, soon. I, I, would, I would love to. I'm, 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 I just lots of things that are going on. That's the, that's always the challenge. And and if it gets yes. too deep into higher category theory, I'm, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm not as useful as, as otherwise. The, although I am, I am, I finally that one of the things that's happened this year is I'm no longer, I'm no longer thoroughly afraid of category theory. And I'm, I'm, and I'm also have the suspicion, which, which may be a big sort of plus for category theory. The question is what the analog of general relativity is for metamathematics. And in other words, if you look at all these theorems that are, you know, follow from all these other theorems, you look at this giant network of theorems and you are somehow observing that giant network of theorems, what are the aggregate things that you can say about it? And the question is, how similar are those aggregate things to things like category theory? And that's the, don't know the answer, but that's okay. <laughs> but for another time. Thank you. All right, well, anyway, terrific. Thank you, Thank you very much. So maybe if you allow me one final question, maybe if, hoping it has a short answer. So uh, how, how far have we come now in simulating the universe? So how many seconds are we in? Oh, well. <laughs> You know, if we could solve this problem about dimension change in the very early universe, that would help a lot. Look, the thing that's the thing that's most interesting, you know, physicists are always keen on, you know, show me an experiment you can do and so on. And so what we'd really like to be able to see is whether there is a signature of dimension change in the early universe that will is visible in the cosmic microwave background. And so that's the thing that that's the sort of the goal. And that's the reason to look at this, um, because all these problems that get solved with, with kind of hacky ideas like inflation, which I have to say, I'm embarrassed to say I was involved in the initiation of back in the 1970s. But that's a the, the I always thought it was a hacky idea. In fact, I never, never really promoted it for that reason. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, this idea of dimension change is an alternative to that. And it probably has signatures in the universe, and we'd really like to find that. But for that, we have to solve these essentially mathematical problems. But so the answer is we're not we're not in a position to. I mean, if we can solve that problem, we might be able to make somewhat general statements about the very beginnings of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, you know, it is not. Unfortunately, we're not in the the um, you know counting number of seconds that we can simulate in the universe. We're, we're, we really would like to get to 100,000 years because then we get to the point that the cosmic microwave background was formed. So that that would be, um, uh, but but it's a, you know, and, and there are, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's a, um, uh, yeah, so that that's not, I mean, this whole question about what large scale features of the universe can you deduce without having to fill in all the details is, is an important question that, you know, is, is, uh, is a part of what we're looking at. Anyway, well, this was, this was great. And I'm, 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 I want to learn more about what you guys do. And I'm trying to understand, well, gosh, all of these. Um, uh, my, my current reading list involves understanding things like the process algebras and all these kinds of things, which I, which I think you guys understand very well and I don't understand properly at all. And I, I, I found that many of these things things, you know, I've encountered in some way or another, but not under these names. And I'm, 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 you know, trying to, trying to understand these, these, uh, these translations, which I, I think can be very valuable. Anyway, I should probably run off because I'm kind of late for something else. And, and um, I, uh, it's, it's great to chat and I, I'm, um, uh, look forward to, yeah, it'd be, it'd be really good to dig in more technical detail and, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you very much again, and and yeah, we, Thank you. we keep we'll this see, coming. See you, <laughs> see you soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a so lot. Bye. Bye.